Good afternoon and welcome to The Gain Line, which is face Wales Online's Facebook Live daily debate show. I'm joined with Simon Thomas and let's start off then with the good news from Wales, Wales Camp this morning. Stephen Jones has given an injury update on Dan Bigger and George North and they are, have both returned to training and Jonathan Davis is back on a phased return to after his knee injury. So that's good news for us. Yeah, it is. Warren Gatlin's talked about a clean bill of health. I think all along when we were concerned about putting more was Jonathan Davis and it kind of ties in with that that we hear he's the one who's been worked back more gradually because you know he's vitally important in that outside centre channel. But yeah, all the signs are good. Um, it's quite rare when you think about four years ago where it was like casualty ward 10 in that Welsh camp with uh, people in particular backs falling by the wayside. It's great to have what we understand to be a full clean bill of health. Yeah, so hopefully we'll have 31 players to uh, to choose from then. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, okay, moving on now. Um, Simon, you've spent a long time yes, um, pouring over hours. your uh, team of the tournament. So do you want to run us through that? Yeah, I mean, it's um, hostage to fortune, this, isn't it? Because everyone's got their own selection. It makes you realise for one day just what it's like to be a Warren Gatland or an Eddie Jones trying to pick their team. But yeah, it was difficult and certain positions in particularly so. And uh, before I start, I mean, the one thing is, you, as you'll see, there are four Japanese players in this team. Now, who would have thought about that as a possibility before the tournament? Anyway, we'll run through it. I'll start with the fullback first. I mean, I've, I've gone for Bowden Barrett. There was a lot of talk about um, you know, the question of moving him from number 10, whether that was a, a, a wise move, you know, generally seen as the best 10 in the world over the last four years, but it's worked really well, given them two decision makers, and he's still as much of an influence as ever on the, on the team in terms of the number of touches he gets on the ball. So I think he walks in there. Wingers. Oh, that was hard. Let me tell you, there. When I when I can reel off some of the, the wings that haven't made this team, Chesney and Colby, whose dancing feet have lit up the tone. Josh Adams joined top Troy scorer. Uh, Fukuoka, the uh, Japanese man who wing a flyer who just ripped Scotland apart the weekend. You got Damian Pano, Karabati. You got the best Joshua to to us over. All of those don't make my team. So it just shows you how many outstanding wings they've been. But the two wings I've gone for, um, and the right wing I've got for. In a way, the, the player has been the face of the tournament. Um, Matsushima, five tries along with Josh Adams, set the whole thing running with his hat trick against Russia. And just every time he's had the ball in this tournament, you know, he's not only the joint top try scorer, he's like the second most on clean breaks, and he's the fourth most in terms of carries. He's just been one of the real bright sparks, and I, I, I could not leave him out really. Um, we'll go to 13 first, that's the order I've done it. And then one of his Japanese colleagues, Lafayette, um, and he in particular came into his own against the game. In Scotland, such a good decision maker at outside centre, whether it be with a long pass, whether it be with a chip through, or with a dancing and then offload. He's, he's just a really, really talented player. Not someone I was hugely aware of coming into this tournament. And that's the great thing. Sometimes people come along who you're not that aware of and they just grab the tournament by the scruff of the neck. Um, and then speaking of grabbing people by the scruff of the neck, Samu Karevi at 12. Now, he is a handful. We all know about him from the Wales game in particular, where he was involved in that controversial incident with Larice Patchell. But I mean, he is just an absolute force of nature going forward. Uh, um, it carried more ball than any other centre in the tournament and just does damage with, when he goes at people, tends to break the first line of defence and has got the pace to go away. He's going to be a man in particular that England are going to have to watch out for in the, in the quarterfinals. And I come into the other wing, um, as I talked about all the other wingers who didn't make it, and I just couldn't leave this next man out, Sammy Rodradra. I'll go with the old pen just as well as not the full Rodradra because <laughs> This man, I think he's I think he's actually been the player of the tournament. And ironically, his tournament's over. Fiji are out. But he couldn't have done any more to try and get him through. He was just incredible. Played in every game. He made 62 carries, more than anybody. This is a man who's run 400 metres in this tournament. You know, that's an event in the Olympics, 400 metres. He, he's just an absolute force of nature. And I picked him up before the tournament as one of the players to watch, one of the best players in the world. You know, he plays his rugby in France. And if you get a chance to go out and watch him during this season he is just something absolutely extraordinary and uh, it's sad to see him go although yeah. had to go for Wales to progress in a way um, we'll move on quickly then into the halfbacks um, outside half I talked about Bowden Barrett and the fact that he's moved to 15 the reason that's happened is that been Richie Mwanga in at number 10 and they have dovetailed beautifully together. It, it gives New Zealand, as if they needed it, even something more in terms of an attacking threat because they dovetail so well. It gives them two decision makers, they're both on the ball. 
just cl and he's a class act, Rwanga, and uh, it's very difficult to defend against the team when you don't know who's going to pull the strings and you've got two people there who can do it. Um, number nine, we come to our first Welshman. Lovely. There's two Welshmen in there, I'll give you that little clue. Gareth Davis, I mean, you, you know, he, <laughs> there's all this talk, wasn't there, about Reese Webb for a couple of mm -hmm. years before the tournament. Reese is a fantastic player. People say, oh, we need to get him in the World Cup. Well, he's not there. And the man who is there has done a tremendous job in Gareth Davis. You look at every game, his flat passing destroyed Georgia. He, his, it was a tactical triumph, the way he implemented the rush defence against Australia, put, pulling an interception off as a result, crucial score. And against Georgia, you see his support running, the way he set Liam Williams up for the clinching try. And then... You know, top it all off with one of the individual tries of the score of the tournament against Uruguay when he showed he can play on the wing as well. Mm -hmm. He's had a great tournament, he really has. His, his line breaking and his, the pressure he puts on defensively is so important to the way Wales play. And yeah, Gareth, you can be very proud of his assets so far. I'm going to have to turn my page now in my copious notes. Um, Onto the front row. They are uh, hardly readable. Uh, hardly readable. It's my shorthand isn't the, as what well it used to be, I'm afraid. Um, but at, at loose head prop, um, I've gone for one of the other Japanese heroes, uh, Keita Inagaki. He's he was been solid all the way through the tournament. Offered a lot in the loose, and then uh, against Scotland, a moment you won't forget for the rest of his life when he rounded off what I think was one of the team tries of the tournament. Reward for his hard work, and he's done really well. And uh, Kept the old man Joe Marler out of my team. I was tempted to have Mr. Marler in there, but you know, you can wait until the, the, the end of the tournament, perhaps. Um, and then uh, at Hooker, I could easily have gone for another Japanese man because Shota Hori, uh, 54 tackles, into everything. Really tough call. This. In the end, I went for Tutu Latu, who's. Um, who's been unerring in his in his line of throwing and Australia's line has been a big weapon he's been a key factor in that and it actually produced two tries for him as well off of a driving mall and his work rate and his defensive work as well he's just edged it in but that was a close one uh, easier one at tight end tag furlong went into this world cup as the best tight in the world remains the best tight in the world solid as a rock at the scrum buried over two tries in a up and down irish tournament he's really stood out Second row is quite tricky. I don't think there have been particular second rows who really stood out. A lot of ones have put in decent displays. I got a few notes here. James Moore, uh, the Japanese second row, we didn't really know about him. He's working in terms of tackle, it was huge. Guido Petty with his line at work. Uh, Isaac Rodder, a young Australian coming through. And of course, Alan Wynne Jones, who's just been, you know, a, a, as always, a totemic inspiration. But I've actually gone for um, another Barrett, the first, second row, uh, the younger Barrett, um, Scott Barrett, who um, there's a lot of talk before, it's on the bridge, Ritalik, missing out, and how does a New Zealand cope? Well, this man stepped into the shoe superbly. And he's actually taken on a real leadership role as well. <laughs> Scored a couple of tries, has been a big target of the line out, made a load of tackles. He's been a big plus to New Zealand this tournament. And then alongside him, then, a guy who actually didn't make the first game against New Zealand, which is Jujalaga, um, Dejaga. And um, now he has come through during the tournament. South Africa has such a wealth of second rows, but he's just presented a, an unanswerable case. And I think he will probably start in the quarterfinal against Japan. He is just enormous. He is a, he's a big, beef, beefy lot of bock. And uh, you wouldn't want to come across him at all on a rugby field, six foot nine, nearly 20 stone, a real presence. Mm. Then the hardest of the lock, Katie, was the back row. I, I just found that so difficult. Again, if I, if I mention, if you look at number six, the players who haven't made it, who've worn six in this tournament David Pocock, Peter Steph Dutois, Michael Leach, Adi Surveyor, Hamino, Wainwright, Underhill, all of those have worn six. And none of them make my team. Mm. And they've not done so because there's a man at six who I just think is such an absolute key figure for Wales. Um, and I've gone for Josh Navidi. Now, Josh is someone who's had a, a wait a long time for his second goal at international rugby, but now he's doing it on the biggest stage of all. He is just so valuable to Wales in terms of his work at the breakdown, his work in the contact area, non-stop work ethic. And I think his presence also brings the best up in Justin Tipperick. A man who is just consistently uh, delivering week in, week out, game after game. And I think that consistency is a key factor where I've gone mm -hmm. for him there. So Josh is, uh, is the second large man. And just two more before we finish. Um, I mentioned Ali Surveyor played at six. I just couldn't leave him at my team. I think he's probably been the best forward in the world this year. Uh, so I've put him at number seven, which is difficult because mm -hmm. they meant leaving Justin Tipperica, which is going to get an out outcry, particularly from down in Australia. Um, <laughs> and it, Justin has had a, had a fantastic first two games, real tough call. But in the end, 
Um, I've gone for Surveyor. He just, his tackle completion rate, his turnovers, his carries, he's like a one man back row, can do anything six, seven, eight, and I felt he had to be in there. And the same goes for number eight, because uh, you can hear I just think, well, I look at his stats, 46 tackles, 49 carries. That's just extraordinary. And you play six and eight, like all three of my back row, mm -hmm. they can move around. So I think they're a perfect combination. And he has been a real heartbeat of the pack along with Michael Leach. He's young, he's vibrant, he's dynamic. And I think if they are to beat South Africa, he's going to be an absolute key man. And I'm now out of breath. <laughs> um, we had John Mul Mulverhill on this show a couple of weeks ago, didn't we? Talking about mm. how, uh, how Josh Navidi is, is vital, both, both for him and Yeah, the I think the balance of that Welsh back row, he's crucial because um, he's played at eight in this tournament a couple of games. But if you think to back to the Grand Slam, he played six. And I think that's where he's at his best, really, because... Number six blind so traditionally is the real kind of sometimes the unseen work, the donkey work, the nitty gritty, the graft that allows others to flourish. And I think he's particularly good at that alongside Tipperick, alongside Wainwright. Mm. And he is just someone who consistently punches above his weight. And it's just a great story, isn't it, as well? You know, a lovely bloke too. Mm. Okay, um, if you agree or disagree with Simon's uh, team of the tournament, uh, do get your questions and comments in and we will try and get to as many of them as we can. Uh, so we've got one here now. Um, mm. So Craig is asking, will France having had a long break be of great benefit or uh, disadvantage to them for Sunday's quarterfinal? Well, it's even more time for them to fall out, isn't it, mm -hmm. really? Uh, that's the thing. I mean, it's hard to say because there's a balancing act, Joe. On the one hand, you're fresh, mm. but on the other hand, potentially you're undercooked. Now, France have had the one kind of um, big game, if you like, against Argentina, um, where they played superbly in the first half. And then dropped off in the second. That's about three weeks ago now. I mean, and in between that, they had a very iffy game against Tonga. I think they needed another game. They needed to be pushed hard, even if they lost to England, to test out and find out where they were exactly. So I think it might work against them. And as I say, you never know what's going to be behind the scenes there. You don't know who's captaining, you don't know who's coaching, you don't know what they're doing. Um, I suppose we'll find out on Sunday. Mm. Uh, I've got another one here then. Uh, given the Wales performance against Uruguay, uh, have we really got the strength in depth that we thought we had? It's a good question. I mean, I think it was disappointing um, in terms of the skill levels, forward passes, knock-ons, struggled at the breakdown as well. Um, we've been a lot of talk of the last years about having two quality players in each position. I think you would have to say it is always a little bit difficult when you've probably been sitting, either sitting down or ha holding a tackle bag for three or four weeks and training for months and you get that one opportunity, press trying to force it a little bit, a bit of rustiness. Um, but I think there is more depth than there was four years ago. Um, I just think it was a bit disappointing that you didn't have what you might call the fringe players really putting their hands up so uh, mm. yeah it's still a work in progress the strength in depth I think that's fair to say okay and big news today now is the uh, referees have been announced for the quarterfinals this weekend so Nigel Owen has got a big one on Saturday New Zealand v Ireland mm, it's just a huge game for Nigel and I mean it doesn't mean that you're guaranteed the final World Cup final referee to be one of the four that's been chosen but mm. clearly it you means you'd have thought, so, thought that you're high up in the pecking order it shows that you're highly rated after what's gone on the group stages massive game for Nigel that you know um, Ireland have beaten New Zealand twice in recent years let's not forget that and it's going to be I would imagine Ireland and have had a sort of you know frustrating World Cup for them it's not going to the ones and they will be absolutely straining at the leash we know what New Zealand bring in terms of the challenge of the breakdown so it's going to be a big challenge for Nigel but uh, he'll be a British in that opportunity mm -hmm. I know and then we've got Jerome Garces for England Australia and Wayne Barnes for Japan v South Africa and then we've got Jacko, Jacko Piper. Piper for Wales yeah France. the South African Jacko Piper who's had a, um, he's had a few sort of interesting occasions with Wales I, if I remember rightly he was referee when Ross Moriarty got sent off in Argentina mm. um, he was involved I think as well in um, you know Lions matches before a very experienced referee um, one thing I'm a little bit surprised about there's no antipathy in there there's no New Zealander mm. uh, no Australian I think Nick Berry the New Zealander had a very good tone. A bit surprised not to see him involved there. But Wales will know a lot about Piper mm. and our readers will as well because our, our very uh, knowledgeable colleague Anthony Wolford is putting together a piece on who is Jacko Piper. So you can read that later today. And uh, yeah, he's uh, he's a man that Wales will want to be working out before the game and wanting to stay on the right side of. Yes. And what what, what do you think they'll be t taken care of mostly? Or is it? I think the break. Be yeah. In, into any game. I, 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 I think the breakdown is an absolutely crucial area. Um, Wales are at their best. I've always said this over the last, if you look at the winning run the last year, 
when Wales p perform, given the way they play, which is quite defence-based still, although they've got a few tries, nice tries in this one, they're still very defence-based. So as such, you've got to be right on the edge physically. You've got to be right on the top of your game physically and mentally and in terms of uh, abrasiveness. And I think that's why the contact area against the French should be crucial. So I think Navidi will have a big role to play. Alman Jones, the mm -hmm. likes of this, and the ball carrying. Um, and I think as well, France, uh, you know, can be indisciplined when strained and put under pressure. Wales will look to stress them by retaining ball, going through ball, look to build up penalties, look to get a, a winning lead that way, and then basically sort of try and see the game through. I mean, they've won seven of their last games against France. They know how to beat them, and um, they'll be confident going into this. Okay, I hope so. Uh, so we've got a couple more questions now before we uh, before we finish up. So Richard is asking, is there merit in considering a Rugby World Cup bowl trophy running parallel with the cup for the pool teams that did not progress? Yeah, I saw this question on my feed earlier. And I really like the idea. You think about sevens tournaments, it's the mm. way it works. The teams that go out at the group stage then play on. And it'd be a real re reward, you know, for the like, like a team like Uruguay. Nobody expected anything. And they've beaten Fiji, gave Wales a hard afternoon. It'd be lovely to see them going through I mean Fiji as well I talked about Rodrada how lovely mm. be great be to see more of them I suppose the difficulty is that all the clubs around Europe want these players back now <laughs> don't they you know and so they'd probably have to be a compensation thing but even if it was like something that lasted just one more week mm. you know with perhaps one maybe a semi-final in midweek and then a final maybe for a bowl and a plate I think that'd be brilliant you know if you could you can potentially see something like Fiji against Italy maybe mm. going for the maybe for the, the bowl the plate if that's the second one and then maybe something like uh, I don't know Uruguay against uh, what are the Welsh boys Namibia <laughs> Phil Davis's yeah. boys or Russia or something like that that'd be, be lovely wouldn't it but mm. yeah maybe one for 20 what's next 2023 yeah well good maths <laughs> okay we've got another one then then um, how have the Japan side been able to improve to the level that they are at now I mean, it's, it's not um, a one-off thing, it's not mm. a fluke. If you look at their record of the last year, particularly in the Pacific Rim, where they played the likes of Fiji, Samoa, Tonga, and America, the, the record's been very good. I did wonder, though, because when they played uh, their warm-up games, they lost by 40 points mm. to South Africa, and I thought, well, maybe you know, they haven't been able to move up to the very level they want. Uh, but clearly, come the tournament, come home advantage, come everything, it's, it's clicked. And I think there's a key, this key fact is they're fit, they're very fit, they tackle low, which in this World Cup's a good idea. And they've got an outstanding coach in Jamie Joseph. They had a good run in Eddie Jones. But and you can see why Jamie Joseph was sought after by a lot of people. I know the Cardiff Blues, I think, looked at him at one point. And mm. I, I'm sure now that uh, there'll be other big teams and countries around the world looking at him because he's got them so well drilled. Defensively, they've been outstanding. They've got, I say, a hooker, a hooker's made more than 50 tackles. You know, mm. it's extraordinary. And the other thing is, they are, what we always knew about them, is that they've got a natural ability with ball in hand. Their offloading game is just one of the joys of this tournament. You know, it's gone before you even see it in the hands. They just they're skillful. They've always been skillful, but now they've got a game plan. Mm. They've got an attitude, and who knows what they can achieve? Yeah, they've been a joy to watch, haven't they? Mm. Okay, last question then. Uh, what players are in contention for a starting position against France, um, particularly the ones who started at the weekend just gone? Yeah, and the interesting one to me again is that back row. Um, because obviously they brought Ross Moriarty in to start against Fiji with Justin Tiprick stepping down. Mm. And you've kind of got a, f a four into three doesn't go because you've got Tiprick, Wainwright, Navidi, Moriarty. Someone has to miss out and be on the bench. I've said before, I think Navidi has to be in that team for mm. the nitty gritty he brings. Having watched Wainwright again in that match against Uruguay in a new position for him in number eight, mm. they, he was a difference. When he took the ball, everything seemed to move faster, more dynamically, more explosive. He has to start. I would actually start him at eight because I think Navidi's at his best at six. He showed in that game he can pick up the dynamism off the base mm. and I'd go tip break at seven. So I think Wainwright, of the starters against Uruguay, he's the one who I think... My view is that he has to play. Mm. So you'd go with Moriarty on the bench again? I think I would, yeah. I, I mean, the same as for the first two games, but maybe jig it round, as mm. I say with Wainwright at eight. But you can you can swap in that during the game, as needs be. But that's the trio we're going. I think the rest of it pretty much picks itself as long as everyone is fit, really. Mm. OK, so we've got the uh, team announcement to look forward to in the early hours of Friday morning. 4am shift there. for me, uh, uh -huh. so I know, set the alarm. OK, well, thank you very much. Anyway, you've been watching the Game Line and we'll be back same time, same place tomorrow. Have a nice day.